the president's key economic team goes to China. Uh, after a whole night thinking, I say I still want to do it. <laughs> Hey there, this is Ray Ma, your China Tech Analyst. Welcome to Tech Buzz China Livecasts by Pan Daily. As the name suggests, these conversations are recorded live and then edited for your listening pleasure. Some of these chats are open to the public, and we welcome you to join us. So be sure to follow us on Twitter or sign up for our mailing list to get notified. Remember, members of Tech Buzz China Insider get priority access. So. If you're an investor or operator looking to join the smartest community online focused on China tech, go to techbuzzchina.com and see if you qualify. Extra thanks to our partner Pandaily.com, where you can learn everything about China's innovation. Thanks for subscribing, guys, and do give us a review. Hey, everyone. I'm so pleased to present this fascinating interview with an old friend of mine, Andy Tian. Andy is the founder of Asia Innovations Group, which is a company that has a suite of live social apps covering video social, social dating, and social fandom. As of June 30th, 2021, the company had more than 410 million registered users located in over 150 countries and regions worldwide. Some of Asia Innovations apps that you might have heard of might be Uplive, L'Amour, Superfans, Wink, or Fancy You. Or maybe not, since they're really mostly targeted at emerging markets and young people. Andy was born in China, grew up in the United States, and he founded Asia Innovations in 2013 to do, well, pretty much exactly what the name says take the most interesting things he was seeing in China and throughout Asia at the time and export it to the rest of the world. Andy has some strong opinions about what's the best way to do that. And I think you'll really enjoy his insights. So here we go. Andy Tian of Asia Innovations Group. If you're here, you basically followed my prompt of copy from China, exporting live social apps globally. And that is the topic we have today. Andy Tian is the CEO and founder of Asia Innovations Group, which is behind some of the biggest live social apps that are active outside of China. Can you tell us a little bit about your personal background as well as Asia Innovations Group? Sure, I'll start with the company. Asia Innovations Group is a leading live social company focused on emerging markets. So we've been around for eight years now. And together we have a, a set of a social products that operate across all emerging markets. So we are a little unique in that. We don't focus on this one. So these emerging markets include MENA, Middle East, North Africa, Pan India, South Asia, British China, and the uh, Americas, particularly South America. We have several flagship products. Applied is the largest independent live social video platform out of China. Lamor is the number one downloaded dating app across emerging markets. Superfans is the number one social fans platform in China and uh, growing internationally as well. We also have other businesses going online. Altogether, we serve 400 million users and uh, with our 12 offices around the world, together we have 1,400 staff. We're a unique reading that we take a serious approach to the concept of live social as we explained before. Live social is basically very simple. Fire kind of a uh, social products are created for text chats, photos, short videos, long form videos, all about products, allow users to communicate and socialize live directly via video or voice. Exactly like right now what we've been doing, but a bit more fun, that's what live social media means. So I think that's just naturally where the world is going, especially in its climate. So personally, it's kind of a misnomer to have a group to name as a, a Chinese company, right? I think that companies these are global by definition because your products will be downloaded and will be used by global users. So we are headquartered in China, but our background is a mix of East and West. A little bit of my old personal background. I was born in China. I moved to New York in Queens when I was 10 and survived the hard knocks of Brooklyn and high school. Went to MIT, Brooklyn Designs, 
and came back to Asia in 2000 as a young guy and then looking for startups. So I founded one of the earliest social startups in China in 2000, allowed users to create their own website content around music. So my space in Chinese in 2000. Yeah, that didn't go well. So we had a lot of users, but missing something called revenue. Then I wanted to learn more about this thing called revenue. So I went to BCG in two years doing consulting. After learning about adjusting the best font and color and with two by two charts, I went to Google when Google first started. So I joined in October 2005 and then led the mobile business in China, introducing the Android system to China and the Asian world. So that was really fun. So I'm still a loyal Android user up until now. And 2008, uh, Startup Bug did again. I started one of the earliest sort of game companies in 08 on Facebook, based in Beijing. So we had a mix of a Western and Eastern staff, even in 2008, to develop English-based sugar games that were played by millions of people using some of the Chinese mechanics. And then they acquired my company in 2010 to become Zynga China. So I ran Zynga China about 2010, 2013. And at, at the height, Zynga China was the largest independent original game developer studio in Zynga, outside asset headquarters. And we, again, even though it was a team of about 300 based in Beijing, we developed games that were in 10 different languages played by users around the world. So Asian Innovations is simply an extension of my experience since 2008. Okay, thanks for that background. I learned a little bit as well. But really, when I met you, you were still a Zynga China. And yeah. I remember in 2013, you said you were going to quit and start this company, Asia Innovations, for this reason. That there were innovations coming out of Asia, specifically China, and that you wanted to take globally. Could you tell a little bit about what were you seeing at the time that made you think about life social as a sector that you wanted to play in and take out of China? I think it's about hat of American, right? And the Chinese, those two different hats. From an American point of view, I was from the angle of Google and Zynga. So I think arguably two of the more established consumer companies. And then with also the ongoing trend of Android as mobile device. What I saw is that the US and China companies are also building infrastructure, right? A newest technology innovations that basically still power all of the world from Android, from HTML5, from Java, and then languages and so, so forth. So I think that the Chinese domestic economy and ecosystem, because it was uniquely far walled off, created a different ecosystem. The American consumer internet has always been driven by Google. So you build consumer products and you just connect to Google AdSense, and you add APIs and you make money. Focus on building, serving your users, make great content, and then the money will come. So you don't have to really worry about how to generate revenue if you have an engaged consumer user base. In China in 2000, well, Apple was only five and six, even then, there was no ads. Internet ads was a very small reference stream. So for companies to survive, they could not rely on just serving users, getting traffic. They had to generate revenue directly from end consumer. And what happens? Games and what's called as mobile value added services were two of the biggest revenue streams that supported Chinese tech company in the early days. I think that that's part of the biggest difference that result in some of the innovations that's coming up. For example, when I was at Zynga, Zynga was actually one of the first large internet companies, data company in the US that was fully based on a virtual items revenue model, microtransaction model from games, right? The first one. So before they, I, I know you're talking to many of my friends in the US, oh, we're just this based game model. Well, that, that will never work in the US. You know, we just want to pay for a monthly fee at the, the box space. So I think that these differences in kind of a consumer behavior and, and ecosystems is what's creating the differences now. So what are the underlying drivers of uh, innovation say? I remember you reading in an interview you had recently with Ping West, right? Like you actually said that your friend at Instagram had suggested virtual goods and then he yeah. got shot down because it just didn't fit into the business model of the company. Yeah, not only him, but I think that just uh, a lot of the virtual goods, a lot of the innovations, quote unquote, about Asia, about China, have already been in the U.S. It's just that when the company is very large in the U.S., people could get very conservative in terms of pushing new boundary, which that's the, actually one of the stark differences. When U.S. companies get large, they slow down a lot. But Chinese ones, they do a lot more. 
I completely agree there. So anyway, in China at this time, you're starting the company 2013. There were actually a lot of other companies that were trying to export Chinese apps abroad. So I can think of Cheetah, Apus. Cheetah is not really anywhere to be seen at this point. I think Apus is still around actually, but most of them are tool-based companies. You decided, however, to start with games and to do live social. What are you thinking about your same cohort of companies? And do you think that their current fates surprise you at all? As you're doing a startup, I think that you don't really think about the landscape too much. So I think most people, when they create startups, it's based on what they know and the sector that they know and their experiences. So I've been doing mobile, international mobiles, uh, and also store games since 2008. That's what I know. So naturally, I didn't really look at the other companies, what they're doing so much as what I know, you know, what I see as the biggest opportunity. I already saw that there's a lot, with a ton of product innovations, rival virtual goods, gamified social revenue model. Remember, we build social games as they go, right? So that we saw the social aspect was the key of games growth. But what if we turn it around, not build social game, but build gamified social? So we started a company, we didn't even think about live social, right? That was eight years ago, but we did think about our code was gamified search. What if we stop building games, far games where people can send their some socialized community game? You turn around, you build a social platform where people can play games directly in the chat window. Just like Facebook Messenger games right now, but except back in 2013, 14. So and that's persisted across all of our parts currently. The Chinese space companies going international was only a trickle back then. And now it's becoming a little stream. Still not full river yet, will become. So I want to hone in on Yunying or operations. It's basically a huge part of live social. It's actually a huge part of e-commerce in China as yeah. well. It's something that I think people in the West don't really understand because that's not how Western companies work. I want you to explain what you think Yunying or operations mean and why do you think that's especially important for your type of business? Sure. I think that it's something that Silicon Valley based companies folks don't understand maybe, but if you ask any restaurateur, any retail group in the U.S. that actually serves users directly, that get revenue, pay users directly, they completely understand what it is because it's called service. Right? It's servicing users. You did pay you, they expect a level of service and you serve it. In the Valley, we live in a bubble. If you go into Google, if you go into Zynga, if you go into the biggest consumer companies in games. In entertainment, they all expect service. I give you my, my money. I have problems. I have issues. I want to be with the contact you. Look at Airbnb. Yes, they have a great platform, but they have a very large servicing department. And that customer servicing comes to two parts, right? One is the basic platform as like reactive servicing. If you're running the issues, problems, ones of product, there must be a way for the paid consumer, not the paid consumer's money, to contact you, to get resolved. Number two is also for marketing and then engaging users. So in e-commerce, that's called, um, like black products, right? Discounts, operations, and so on and so forth. So you need to proactively engaging users with marketing events and content. And also the reason for your users to continue to pay you. And on the reactive side, you must serve users that have issues at all. So that's what we call in China. So basically when Chinese users, they're just expecting something different each time they log in a new promotion or a campaign or maybe some new mini game, basically yeah. something else that's going on. Even if I logged in this morning and I'm logging in tomorrow, I might want to see something different. And that's not maybe as Western users were a little bit easier because we haven't been as serviced as well by the app makers. I just want to emphasize to the audience, like how much operations there are in the typical Chinese internet company. For your company, how many operations staff would you say there are just on like a rough percentage basis? We have total company, total hundred staff across. So we have a couple hundred engineers and product managers. So probably I would say half a company in one way or another serves the users. Yeah, that sounds very similar to what I would say most, even some of the biggest internet companies in China. Like a lot of people don't realize ByteDance, for example, has a ton of operations staff. It's not just an algorithm running. In large U.S. internet companies too, even though they don't talk about it. I was on Google, right? Zynga. Actually, a huge amount of Zynga staff were in service. So again, servicing, just not customer service. 
it's proactive content marketing that's revenue generation. So I would say engagement and service. Those two are the best combination to describe the Chinese already. The reason why you see Chinese companies do a lot more than the US is one thing, survival. The competition in China is so brutal, competing left and right. There's no holds bar. It's just like UFC without the Africa in China, literally. <laughs> and then in the States, like play tennis. There's no judge in the Chinese style. If with that level of competition, everybody fights over you, the customer. So you have to employ any tactics you can to engage this user because if you don't, the next 10 guys are going to be your lunch. So you're in a box. US, the level of competition is far less. Kai Fu Lee is fond of saying that as well. There are other companies like Asia Innovations going abroad using this type of China inspired, China trained methodology. So I know in your space, there is Yala and there's also YY's Bigo. Can you tell me a little bit more about what do you think makes you different from the competition? Sure. Number one, we are the only company, one of the co-founders is actually American. So we actually understand the how international market culture and behavior really works. That's really important and deep. Two, we are fully multi-region. For example, Yala operates in mostly Middle East and people focus on a couple of markets. We're very local, right? We operate in all in margin regions at the same time. Three, we're not focused on any one product, even though our biggest product right now is live video social, live streaming. We are focused on the next generation of social. First generation, Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat, whatnot, had this idea of one app is the law, right? Because there was nothing before. Right? You don't have any photo apps for Instagram. So of course, everybody use it around the world. But now that everyone has grown up on this first generation mobile, people want different experiences, want customized, especially if you look at emerging markets, different language, different religion, different culture behaviors, right? The folks in the Middle East and the folks in Brazil want very, very different things and they do not play together. So I think that the idea that we espouse and we actually execute towards is that we have fundamental social principles for the company. Otherwise, live so feature, video voice, interactions across everything, number one. Number two, heavy service and engagement users. Number three, gamified revenue model on top of social. But with these constant and all core force analytics, right? heavy analytics driven experience from the data days, our products will be much more and more customized, more and more tailored towards a particular emerging market areas. For example, one of our dating apps like Omigo is focused on Spanish speaking emerging market users. That's really interesting because in general, you see people try to have a global app, right? Especially when people look at TikTok success, it's like, oh, if you have the right idea, then this should be able to fit everywhere. And you're saying you're betting on the other direction. We're in, we're in the first area of the social baseball game. So like I said, we are literally in the very early days, right? So if you have never eaten rice or well, fried rice is fine. But once they've eaten rice before, they want noodles, they want dumplings, they want curry rice too. So I think it's a matter of user having grown up on the first day of products. Now they want more or better, more customized. Do you think that being multi-region from the get-go, were you able to learn things from one region that you could apply to a different region? Very interesting. Yes. I think we plan to be multi-region and multi-product portfolios. Simply fun experience of looking at Google, a little bit of Zynga, Facebook, and Tencent. My co-founder was the second in command of Tencent's corporate strategy where he ran mobile product strategy and international strategy. So we look at how do we build a hundred billion dollar companies or even a $50 billion dollar company. You must have a couple and then you must have a large set of geographic areas to serve. And that's literally how we decided to be multi-region because uh, China and U.S. are two single contiguous markets that are big enough to create by themselves $50 billion dollar from the billion dollar companies. But if you look at outside China and U.S., each emerging market region is still a bit small, right? So. You have to serve all of them to be the going up. So I think that that's the, just the practical reasons why we started. And we've seen that advantages of you building operations in one single region does not necessarily mean that you can operate in another region. It takes two to three years to actually be somewhat functional in any international market. So we've chosen the beginning instead of one single region and then sequentially go to another. It's going to be hard anyways. Let's do it parallel. So we built. 12 offices is literally two years, and then each one of them is at least three, four years old. So 
that allows us operationally now be able to have a stable base in which to grow all of our products. So I would say business structure strategy, like considerations from the very beginning. And then in terms of learnings, I think the biggest learning is that number one, it's hard stuff to even start and work with. This is the reason why you don't see that many companies like us to even do any emerging market social, because it's just a really hard thing. You don't have previous infrastructure, uh, the phones are still less powerful, data rates are very high. And people are not training social, right? The servicing requirement is high. Remember users economic level is now determined how much service they want. Doesn't matter if they pay a dollar or hundred dollars. They actually kind of just have to say, you know, local service is a long time to build up and be able to provide the best experience for users. And I think the other thing we learned is that there are many commonalities. We look at social use cases, what we do really well, especially young people. If you remember, emerging markets have a larger proportion of young users than China or US. We are young, doesn't matter if you're a Vietnamese user or an Indian user or South American user. You actually want, you spend a lot of time online and you're very easy to pick up live video, live social. You don't mind showing your face as people who are those who are a little older, 35, 40, so they pull that up and then so on so forth. But young people, they don't mind. And they have a lot of time are open with instant unscheduled experiences, right? And serendipity is huge. Now, those of us who are older, 30, 35, let me send you a schedule. Please look at my camera. Let's get a 15 minute catch up. That's alien. Schedule social interaction is completely alien to young people across, doesn't matter what language, what culture we want. What young people are interested in most, the opposite gender. That's all you can think about. There's, there's some fundamental deep social needs that are cut across all regions. Like explains your portfolio is pretty heavy on dating. So live stream shopping, do you think it's going to take off outside of China? Like I see Amazon's Prime Day live streams are disappointing. Just because you're a large, successful company doesn't mean that you can do everything successful. So on the first try, I saw that. I was like, great job, guys. First try. I think like Mr. Bezos may be busy with other things going to the move. So I think that live stream shopping is an organic result of a couple of different trends in China that's been going over 10 years. Right? Number one, the live stream itself in China has become a mass like mass market feature. Everybody's on live streaming for a long time, watching celebrities, the news, everything. So everybody's used to the concept and user experience of live streaming, number one. I think mean, number two, there's incredible amount of uh, speed of size scaled of e-commerce online and enabled by logistics. People are lazy. I sit home, tick, 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 package job. Number three, pandemic last year, where people don't want to go out to jobs. And then, so I think all these things combine together to create an explosion of e-commerce you saw. The last year, I think it was something like $150 billion were transacted last year in China, right? It was like 2.5x, 2.3x growth from the year before. And this year it's going to be even much bigger. But live stream shopping in China started a couple of years ago. It wasn't that big. It was natural if you're a streamer, if you are somewhat of a YouTuber, Instagram, you wear hockey products online. That's what you do naturally in the States too. The concept of seeing the product and buying those are two different platforms to the state. In China, it's the same platform. I think mean, that's what created explosion. Before, something like Xiaohongshu, Le Red Book, they had live stream shopping too, but they didn't work because again, have the link back to Taobao. Back to a separate platform is what killed. It's what's going to kill the live shopping chain. So once you see Amazon, once you see like the big e-commerce guys themselves, get into and understand more live streaming, that's what's going to take off in the U.S. or anywhere else. Always like to point out that it was Alibaba that kind of willed the sector into being by making it such a huge part of their site. All right. One question that came in from the audience, why have emerging markets become so hot recently? It's a lot of users in emerging markets, right? They are overlooked a bit right before because they were still, China was in emerging markets has now since emerged. So I think it's a natural growth of the economy and, and history. So now by the time that we talk about how hot emerging market is on a podcast, it's probably has already been hot for a while. And also because the economics and the infrastructure is getting to a point in which internet companies can accelerate. But it's one of those things where these companies have been building for 10 plus years. There's a question specifically about India. What do you think are some of the common factors that show that, hey, you've reached an inflection point for virtual goods. Specifically, what do you think it'll take for it to reach escape velocity in India? 
I think rich goods is a natural result of having a sizable game industry first. That's the prerequisite or the tool that educate users and build up the, the infrastructure for that. Number two is efficient and frictionless payment infrastructure, right? So China also benefit hugely from the early availability of, of Alipay and now WeChat Pay as two frictionless payment methods for all of China, right? And then US, Europe, advanced probably obviously having credit cards, right? So as a frictionless payment method as well, I think for India, these two things are still being solved. It's not about users unwilling to pay. They really want to pay for stuff. The rise of PTN and UPI, universal payment, I think has accelerated this, sure. But I think the basic gaming industry in India is still rising. These two very small. So once we see the gaming industry in the world war, we'll see a lot more virtual goods, virtual item based revenue model by India, but that's coming for sure. What are some of the other trends you see for live streaming and dating apps? As we know, Seoul is a company from China that was about to go yeah. public. They just pulled their IPO. The company is doing pseudo anonymous dating. So you actually can't even upload your avatar. You just have yeah. this like cartoon character basically that you play with. Yeah, I think young people naturally, on one hand, they don't want to use their picture in public. So many of us on WhatsApp, Facebook, don't use our own pictures, right? So that's a natural way of we going to more anonymous, more non-close or non-internet, non-intimate friend space circle that you naturally want to protect your own identity, especially, I would say, girls, right? So that's the same psychological driver for everything. I think so, just a, a natural, again, it's like natural evolution. Of, of social in which people chat on voice a lot. And so it's more of a live voice social chat. It's not really dating, it's more, I would say, social discovery, right? You are socializing with other friends purely online without being offline. And that's been happening in the US for a long time too. LinkedIn is probably the largest online social discovery platform for, you know, older people. And those models being around everywhere, just that China has more variety of it. I'm just laughing at you saying LinkedIn is a social discovery for what is the role of recommendation algorithms in your apps, especially given that TikTok, it's very easy to understand, right? It's a short video. They start off with whatever, 30 seconds, right? So you react and you train the data set very quickly. But for live streaming, how does that work? I think recommendation algorithm is just a basic part of any consumer app where there's more choices than what a consumer can pick, right? So from e-commerce to video, to data, to even text and the article. I think most companies do recommendation to some extent. So for us, it's like live streaming, right? We have at the same time, if you scroll to any app, you see like, a couple thousand live streams for us attack. Which one's better for you? You probably don't know, but we might know. Based on your past viewing, it's very simple. If you go into a type of broadcaster streamer, you go in there for 10 seconds, you leave. You go into another streamer and you say about 10 minutes, you interact. A strong sign of engagement. And we try to figure out why. Do you like what the content is? Is it the same language? Certain kind of demographics match there? Isn't there more? type of users, so on and so forth. So they're very simple and clear signals that will enable us to service. Again, because the recommendation is all about surfacing things that you otherwise cannot discover to you. So we do that across all of our apps. And of course, the bigger app, the more user we have, the more we can actually serve better recommendations. I guess this question is about follow-up recommendation algorithm for physical dating. Longer yeah. user feedback loop than video. Recommendation algorithm for dating is one of the holy grails of dating. However, the issue is that I think we can only do recommendation with dating to a certain extent because most people think that they can date better, that they should have better dates than they actually can get. Our dating is more social discovery, more socializing online. We're not focused on really getting that single transactional dating. Online dating has become too transactional and it does not no longer reflects how real world people really meet. I think that's where the downfall of algorithm is that you are becoming so efficient in meeting two of them together. You lost like social, I think, envelope and support, which is critically needed for real data to happen. What is sort of the inflection point for emerging markets for virtual goods? What do you think I'll take for live streaming? The inflection point is not there yet. I think number one, that it's also the, because live streaming in China moves so quickly because there are enough companies that are doing it. Live streaming is never about it. The, just the technology part, right? Mobile live streaming was created in the U.S. Paris called Meerkat. And we all know how that went down. 
So because there's a lack of service of, of users, lack of engagement, just the pure platform product doesn't really work. It's really about the ecosystem within emerging markets that people need to get used to live streaming. And then there are a couple of the major kind of content areas that are still ramping up, for example, gaming. So there's only Twitch, right? That is still mostly in the US. India is not there yet, but it's coming. So I think that there's a lot of these extra pieces that provided the rise of live streaming in China. That would need to happen first in emerging market. I would predict that in the next three years, really important. Like all across the emerging markets or? In South Asia, it's huge already because culture is to China, right? Middle East is a little bit slower. India will come next. So the more Eastern emerging markets, the faster this thing is taking out. Because the Chinese companies are going there. It's culture, or Asian cultures. And then it's easier for them to kind of project over there. That's it, everyone. Thanks for listening. And if you're really serious about China Tech, join our insider community. You do have to take a quiz, so make sure you listen to all of our past episodes on China Tech on our main Tech Buzz China podcast. Also, a huge thank you to our editors, Carrie Huang and Bryce Ye, and of course, the entire Pan Daily team for all of your help. See you next time.